So this video is a continuation of uh, my discussion uh, on the subject of riba and uh, of course its comparison with interest. So today's question is, it, is interest allowed in a personal loan uh, transaction? Now first of all, uh, let me explain what is a personal loan transaction. In a personal loan transaction, normally what happens is that one party, the creditor, offers loan to the other party, the debtor or the borrower, to meet his or her personal needs like education of children, for example, or um, uh, marriage of children, or even to meet day-to-day uh, -day living expenses. So all these are examples of uh, uh, personal loan transactions that we may witness in our day-to-day -day life. Now. Uh, Interestingly, what has happened that, uh, as I explained earlier, that although the Glorious Quran categorically defines riba as something excess or abnormal growth, please refer to chapter 3, verse 130 of the Glorious Quran, but still, uh, based on taklid or blind falling, majority of the Muslims believe that interest and riba are two similar concepts. So, because of this prevalent confusion uh, during the past, almost 1500 years, Muslim scholars have not come up with a clear model of financial management whereby they can clearly distinguish interest from riba. Now with reference to personal loan transaction and uh, as a question that I have put in, is it interest allowed in a personal loan transaction? If you put this question to uh, an ordinary Muslim, he would blindly say, okay, it's not allowed because interest is riba. But when we look at uh, the relevant verses of the glorious Quran, we find that probably the answer is totally different. For example, if uh, you refer to chapter 2, verse 278 to 80 of the glorious Quran, these verses read, Believers, be afraid of God and weigh what is still due to you from riba, if your faith be true, or war shall be declared against you by God and his apostle. If you repent, you may retain your principles, suffering no loss and causing loss to none. If your debt be in straits, grant him a delay until he can discharge his debt. If you waive the sum as charity, it will be better for you if you but knew it. Now these verses basically provide a holistic perspective on the concept of riba and its relationship with interest, inflation, and specifically to as these concepts are applicable to a personal loan transaction. Now, there are three options that have been offered by these beautiful verses of the Glorious Quran. The first option is that as a believer, you are not allowed to charge riba or excess interest or premium over the principal amount of loan. And if you have done it, you must repent. But to the extent of inflation, you are allowed to charge interest or a premium over the principal amount. The very phrase, suffering no loss and causing loss to none, is a manifestation to this fact. So it means the glorious Quran uh, is applicable to both the creditor and the debtor in this specific case. And the Lord Almighty commands that equity or fair dealing demand that neither the creditor nor the borrower should suffer any loss. And logically speaking, we understand that in modern times, even in medieval times, inflation is 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 a, is a practical uh, a manifestation of real life. So, if the amount of money loses its purchasing power because of inflation, for example, if somebody has borrowed hundred dollars and say that person is going to return that hundred dollars in one year time, and there's a three percent inflation rate, so logically speaking, the hundred dollar that will be repaid after one year will have 3% less purchasing power. So going by the strict interpretation of this verse of the glorious Quran, suffering no loss and causing loss to none, then it is obligatory upon the debtor or the borrower to compensate the creditor to the extent of 3% in this case. That is the rate of inflation that was prevalent during the tenure of the loan. So this is one option. Then another option is that if your debtor be in straits, then you must extend the repayment date of the Loan. Now this is based purely based on humanitarian grounds. So, uh, if uh, the creditor believes that the debtor is not a cheater and uh, he has never done that earlier, and generally he or she is in dire straits, then humanity would demand, even uh, morality would demand 
that the repayment date of the loan may be extended. This is what is provided in the glorious Quran. And the third option is that if the creditor's circumstances are good and he or she can afford to waive off that sum of loan as charity, probably that would be the most commendable act in the sight of God. So again, it will depend upon the individual circumstances. Now, if uh, we just look at the crux of uh, the matter that is highlighted uh, in these verses of the glorious Quran with reference to today's question is uh, interest allowed in a personal loan transaction, then we can say that these verses of the glorious Quran explicitly recognize the concept of inflation that is suffering no loss and causing loss to none. So it means inflation is, is an economic reality that is recognized by the Quran and its eternal wisdom. And we know that inflation impacts the purchasing power of money. So in this case, that impact, whether negative or positive, must be addressed at the time of repayment of loan that I'm going to demonstrate later through examples. Now we put, I mean, this logic in an equation, in a mathematical equation, it would look like this. If interest or where interest is equal to inflation, there is no riba in it. On the contrary, if interest is greater than inflation, to the extent of that excess, it is riba. So I hope up to this point, uh, I've been able to clarify the difference between interest and riba and the impact of inflation on the purchasing power of money and of course the principal amount of loan. Before proceeding further, I would like to explain some of the economic concepts for those uh, viewers and listeners who, uh, I mean, uh, who are not comfortable with uh, uh, technical economic uh, jargons. So, first of all, what is inflation? Inflation is the process of rising prices, and we all witness it in our day to day life. And we know that when there is inflation, that is, prices are rising then it means the money purchasing power is being eroded. So we can buy less goods and services than what we used to buy earlier because of inflation. Now another related concept uh, would be barter trade. In barter trade, uh, goods are directly exchanged for goods. And uh, of course, this used to be the standard in the primitive uh, societies, but there were certain limitations of barter trade, like lack of double coincidence of wants and lack of store of value and deferred payments, etc., etc. For example, I just give you one simple example: that uh, there is one guy who wants to exchange his uh, 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 rooster uh, with, for example. Uh, uh, some part of a goat. Now he has to find a person who is willing to uh, purchase as many number of roosters that would be equal to one goat and uh, probably this would not be an easy task and uh, it means that the economic activity would come to a standstill. <clears throat> Similarly, I mean if we talked about uh, lack of store of value, so uh, in majority of the cases, the goods may be perishable goods, for example, vegetables, fruits, uh, crops, etc., etc. So you can't really store them indefinitely as you can do with money in modern times. Anyway, uh, butter was a norm in the primitive societies and uh, uh, we need to know that butter is basically exchange of goods for goods. Now, another related concept is commodity money. So commodity money uh, is a concept whereby precious metals like gold, silver, bronze, they are used as money. And uh, of course, this used to be the case in the medieval times and even up, uh, up to 17th, 18th century, certain countries were using uh, commodity money. But uh, with reference to commodity money, we need to keep in mind that uh, there are two uh, uh, problems that may uh, cause inflation in the uh, even in the case of use of commodity money and uh, one is the concept of debasement and the other is excess supply of that precious metal from which you are going to create that money so um, the example of uh, commodity money may be a cryptocurrency in modern times that is a virtual currency and uh, this may be one variant of commodity money in modern times now with reference to debasement, 
Uh, the first noted debasement was done in 54 ACE by Nero in uh, Rome. And similarly, when we talk about excess supply of that precious metal resulting in more, uh, I mean, uh, minting of the coins and all that, that happened uh, uh, in Spain in the 16th and 17th century when the Spanish explorers discovered a bounty of gold and silver and ultimately that caused inflation. So what I'm trying to highlight is that in case of barter trade, inflation or the possibility of inflation is ruled out because the prices of uh, those commodities or goods are automatically adjusted. Now in case of commodity money inflation may be present if there is debasement because then it's going to lose its purchasing power the content of that uh, specific coin uh, has decreased in value or there is excess supply of uh, precious metal and of course since there's a large supply of money as the monetary is put at that way so excess supply of money would always lead to inflation so this is the case with commodity money also now we talk about fiat money because we all live in a fiat money era, era. and what is a fiat money basically you talk about a hundred dollar bill so its intrinsic value may be about five cents i mean uh, uh, the, the the stuff that it is made of may be worth five five cents but the stamp on it that that bears hundred dollars uh, at it, this is the ex extrinsic value so extrinsic value uh, is basically uh, the value that this particular one hundred dollar bill is commanding at one particular point in time and if due to inflation the prices of other goods and commodities is increasing whereas the value of this hundred dollar bill is locked within this hundred dollar figure so it means it's going to buy less goods and services than what it used to do earlier so this is the problem with fiat money so whenever we're going to use fiat money as is the case with modern economies inflation is an economic reality you can't avoid it so prices will be increasing whether you go by the Canadian school of thought uh, approach or the monetary school of thought approach I mean whether you, you you think that inflation is due to excess supply of money or whether it is demand led factors whatever is it but inflation is always present so since inflation is an economic reality and glorious Quran provides solution to all problems of mankind so it means the relevant verses of the glorious Quran should be capable enough to provide solution to inflation and I have already referred to that the very phrase suffering no loss and causing loss to none is a manifestation to the fact that the glorious Quran acknowledges the impact of inflation and the glorious Quran allows human being to adjust the principal amount of loan in the light of inflation and the erosion in the purchasing power of money so okay let me demonstrate this argument uh, rather reinforce this argument through three simple examples each related to barter system commodity money and fiat money now first example relates to barter system suppose that a has borrowed 20 kilograms of wheat of certain quality from b for a period of one year now in this case of course the debtor is bound to return 20 kilograms of wheat of the same quality to the creditor and in this particular case inflation is not involved because the very commodity in this case the wheat if it is of the same quality there will be no difference between the wheat that was offered as a loan and the wheat that is returned by the borrower so I mean this, this is one classic example so in case of uh, I mean barter system as I explained earlier inflation may not be present so the question of the riba will only arise if the creditor insists that after one year instead of 20 kilogram you have to return 25 kilogram of wheat of the same quality. in this case the excess of 5 kilogram will be riba according to the strict interpretation of the verses of the glorious Quran now the second example relates to commodity money suppose that uh, a has borrowed 10 silver coins uh, of 1 gram each from B with the promise that he will uh, return the same quality of 10 silver coins of 1 gram each. Now in this case as uh, I explained earlier if after one year there is no debasement and there is no excess supply of silver coins in the economy and the purchasing power is more or less intact so the 
debtor can return those 10 silver coins of the same quality and of course there will be no involvement of uh, uh, since there is no inflation and uh, since hundred, uh, 10 coins uh, of 1 gram each have been returned so there is no riba involved in it. On the contrary, if the creditor demands that no, instead of for example uh, 10 silver coins of 1 gram each, I would demand uh, 12 sil silver coins of 1 gram each or say 10 silver coins not of 1 gram rather 1.2 gram each. So this excess will be considered riba and this is strictly prohibited according to the wisdom provided by the glorious Quran. And the third example relates to fiat money. Suppose that A has borrowed a sum of $1,000 from B for one year with a condition that A will return the amount that is equal in purchasing power of $1,000 of today. Now this is logical as I explained earlier that inflation is an economic reality. So we all know that after one year the $1,000 that the debtor has to return will not command the same purchasing power. And if we assume that there was inflation to the extent of 5% then there must be uh, an an addition of premium of 5% uh, over uh, $1,000. So in this case, this would be $50. On the contrary, if there is zero inflation, then $1,000 uh, return will compensate what was advanced to the debtor by the creditor. On the contrary, if there is deflation, deflation because that could be one economic reality in uh, rare cases so we we assume that the prices have fallen by five percent then of course instead of returning one thousand dollar the debtor should return only nine fifty dollar taking into account the deflationary effect now these situations are exactly in line with equity of fair dealing and of course according to the wisdom provided by the glorious quran that neither the borrower nor the debtor should suffer any loss Based on the arguments that uh, I've developed in this video, we can conclude that the best option for a believer is to waive off the loan amount if possible. I mean, if his or her circumstances permit it. He's under no obligation, but Allah Almighty commands in the glorious Quran that this is the best act if you but knew it. And of course, another option is that if the debtor is in dire straits, then you may extend the uh, repayment date of the loan and that is based on uh, of course morality and equity or if you believe that there was inflation during the tenure of the loan but because of your good circumstances as a creditor and fearing Allah Almighty you may waive off the interest component that again will be a good act on your part but if you believe that your circumstances demand that you must get the same amount of money in terms of purchasing power that what we lent say one year six months ago five years ago then there is no bar it is not a sin on your part if you demand interest or premium over the principal amount that may equate more or less the purchasing power of money equal to what it used to be when the loan was advanced so this is the wisdom provided by the glorious Quran now important point to remember is that Islam is a pragmatic religion and the glorious Quran provides solution to all problems and circumstances. Many people unfortunately even the believers they say that uh, uh, the glorious Quran doesn't provide solution to every problem but the glorious Quran rebuts this argument or this statement in the following words for example. Chapter 17, verse 89 of the Glorious Quran reads, In this Quran, we have set out all kinds of examples for people, yet most of them persist in disbelieving. They still say, no, no, it's not complete, so we need some other source of information whereby we can lead our lives. You can only lead your life according to the wish of Allah Almighty if you follow the Glorious Quran. This fact is reinforced. In chapter 18 verse 54 in the following words in this Quran we have presented every kind of description for people but man is more contentious than any other creature so it is the reinforcement of that verse that I discussed earlier that Allah Almighty says that I have presented every sort of example and description in the glorious Quran so it means the glorious Quran provides solution to every human problem provided you have the reason to understand the very commands of the glorious Quran and you don't 
behave like a blind follower or when you read Quran you close your mind and you go with an indifferent attitude okay I don't care for it because I believe Quran is now incomplete so unfortunately what happens is the majority of the followers of Islam are blind followers of individual sects and they never bother to read the glorious Quran meticulously to transform their lives in the light of wisdom provided by the glorious Quran so I believe that uh, we as conscientious believers and Muslims uh, will start reading and studying and understanding the glorious Quran if we're not already doing it to transform our lives like a true believer without I mean falling any sect blindly because there's only one sect in Islam and that is strict monotheism Haniful Muslimun and who's a strict monotheist who follows the glorious Quran that is the straightest path towards salvation and towards approaching Allah Almighty thank you for watching